Previously on Star Hers. Initiate self destruct protocol. Nerdorotic.com. Greetings, you over 845,000 practitioners of common sense and the 40% who haven't subscribed yet. Let's talk about, unfortunately, Ahsoka again. Originally, I had no intention of talking about this episode because, quite frankly, nothing happens until Disney inexplicably and unintentionally told on themselves. And I know, I can hear you. There isn't much to talk about with this entire series outside of another Disney Star Wars character surviving a gut shot from a lightsaber, which are essentially wet noodles now. Now, the bigger news is we did get some ratings. According to Samba TV, 1.2 million U.S. households watched the premiere over six days, which is interesting because there seems to be a bit of a discrepancy with the other ratings that were reported over the very same week. According to Disney, the Ahsoka premiere received 14 million views. And who is Disney's source for this information? Well, it's Disney. Disney lies as Star Wars dies, but is this what they're lying about? Maybe. We'll get into it. But since we're here, let's go over Ahsoka. Don't worry, it won't take long. The good news is Ahsoka episode three is just over 29 minutes. The bad news, considering how much story is actually in it, it's still too long. But there is the added bonus of having fewer men than in the previous two episodes. After a minute and a half recap, which is essentially the entire plot of the first two episodes, we open up with a Jedi training scene and it looks like Sabine is shaking off that lightsaber injury and it didn't take him long to pull out another member berry. Hey, remember Star Wars? Not to be confused with The Force Awakens, which is essentially a New Hope, except this time with a girl. We have yet another callback scene to A New Hope, except this time with women. Here, put this on. I can't see, how am I supposed to fight? This is followed by a girl boss to girl boss scene between General Hera and Mon Mothma, who's getting some of that good space plastic surgery. She's joined by a very diverse group of New Republic senators, and apparently Hera needs to convince the immortal Mon Mothma and her very diverse group of senators for help. Despite Hera just returning from a major intergalactic incident where Imperial sympathizers had infiltrated a major shipyard and were there long enough to construct a hyperdrive bigger than anything the New Republic had made, Preceding that, a valuable prisoner who knows the location of Grand Admiral Thrawn escapes with the help of two Force users, Ray Stevenson and his poodle, who went on to kill the entire crew and scuttle the ship. Sound the alarms. The Corellia shipyard should be shut down immediately. Reinforcements should be called in. Everyone should be on high alert. There should be inquiries. Somebody get on the phone to Han, Luke, and Leia. What do the very diverse New Republic senators say? Nah, it'll be fine. Meanwhile, back to more women in space. We have women sitting around tables and talking about the force, which apparently is something everyone can use now. This is followed by sitting around and talking in cockpits, and this is where Hera lets Ahsoka know that they're on their own. And we're also halfway through the episode. It turns out all the women who are looking for the balls end up converging on a ring. I guess I can say something good to be fair. We didn't go back and forth between the capital of Lethal and Sabine's mid-desert luxury apartment four times and the actresses discovered facial expressions. But that's it. Now to one of the dumbest space battles in all of Disney Star Wars and that's saying something. But first, Disney plus analytics dictate there needs to be another member, Barry. Hey. Remember Star Wars? Remember? Yet another callback to A New Hope and the Millennium Falcon gunner scene. I got him! I got him! Woo! I got one! Except this time with women. And we get a girl on girl space dog fight, but I guess in this case it'd be a cat fight. Ray Stevenson's Pomeranian is unable to stop our heroes, but not to worry. Girl boss Morgan Elsbeth is on the case. Stay clear. I shall deal with them. Prepare turbo lasers. Unfortunately, girl boss Morgan Elsbeth's turbo lasers are unable to get the job done, yet they did disable Ahsoka's ship. And what's Ahsoka's big plan to get out of this jam? Put on a spacesuit go out on the wing of the ship with their lightsabers. The only thing distracting is how fast she got that spacesuit on. And I want you to keep in mind that the clear objective has always been to stop Ahsoka. And the best way to do that would be to destroy her ship and kill everyone on it. So when Ray Stevenson's little Maltese dog says this, We have them. 
Does Ray Stevenson's B. Sean Frise order all three ships to take the clear shot they have and blow that space U-Haul into oblivion? Or does the little pug engage Ahsoka and her lightsabers so she can easily chop one ship in half doing some space gymnastics and easily get away? If you chose the latter, you're watching Disney Star Wars. Well, considering the ratings, you're probably not. You know, I have an editor. Quarter Black Garrett can fix that scene right now. Anyway, our heroes are able to escape Ray Stevenson's Papillon with the help of some hyperspace whales. And the big revelation of this episode, the hyperspace ring was indeed a hyperspace ring, something the audience knew since the previous episode, but it took our female force this long to catch up. And that wraps up another vapid, pointless, bland women in space. And it's on brand for D+, quite frankly. It usually ranges from incredibly forgettable to incredibly cringe. Can't imagine why Disney Plus is a massive failure and won't turn a profit for the foreseeable future. But don't worry, the news gets worse for Disney. To be fair to Disney, although they don't deserve it, when they greenlit Ahsoka, I highly doubt they knew at the time that they needed this to be a massive hit. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but Disney's had a catastrophic year. Disney needs a W in the worst way. Unfortunately, Ahsoka is the opposite of that. And Ahsoka just provides more evidence, not that we needed it, that Disney Star Wars is a dead brand owned by a dead Disney subsidiary, Lucasfilm, which is owned by a damaged parent corporation, Disney. Let's briefly go back to Samba TV's ratings, which are far from perfect, but unfortunately the best we have. Samba TV tracks what appears on the user's TV by reading pixels and utilizing this data for personalized recommendations on the TV or mobile apps connected to the television. This capability extends to streaming programs and even video games. Again, according to Samba TV, Ahsoka was watched by 1.2 million US households over six days, that's an average of 200,000 views a day. Now let's compare it to other Disney Star Wars shows like Obi-Wan, which was watched by 2.14 million US households in four days, averaging 535,000 views a day. Then there's The Book of Boba Fett, which was watched by 1.7 million US households over five days, averaging 340,000 a day. Ahsoka, the show Disney needed to be a big hit, is tracking with Andor, the show that was critically acclaimed and some people liked it, but most people didn't watch it. Ahsoka's numbers are down 29% from The Mandalorian Season 3 and 50% from Obi-Wan. And to rub it in a little more, because you always want to kick a giant corporation when it's down, let's compare it to Secret Invasion. The Disney Marvel show with the second lowest ratings on the platform got 994,000 views over five days, averaging 198,000 views a day. That is just 2,000 less a day than Ahsoka. In response, Disney decided to take a page out of Amazon's playbook. You remember when they announced that 25 million people watched the Rings of Power season premiere? Well, Disney has revealed some numbers. For the first time ever, claiming the Ahsoka premiere over one week, received 14 million views, whatever that means. Of course, this information comes from Disney. Source, trust me, bro. When a streamer like, ne like Netflix says, we're not gonna release our numbers, it's because they're screwing someone over somewhere. Mm. That's true, Sean Gunn, and that might be happening to actors and writers, but I think it's far more likely to be happening to investors and shareholders. And every single streamer, in my opinion, is doing that doesn't make it right. Listen, I don't know what the truth is. I just know that Disney isn't telling it. What makes me say that? Well, coincidentally, on the same day that Disney announced Ahsoka had 14 million views from Deadline, Disney, Bob Iger, Bob Chapik hit with another investor suit over fraudulent streaming costs. Ah, poor Disney, they just can't catch a break. Disney has been hit again with another lawsuit from investors over the alleged sleight of hand accounting the company has used to hide streaming losses. And once again, some big names, Bob's past and present, are being spotlighted. Now, I'm no financial analyst or a lawyer, but I think the technical term here is they're f***ed. Why? Because this isn't the first lawsuit, and it might not be the last. There have already been at least two previous lawsuits in the same vein, one of them coming in the last couple of months. Remember when they fired CEO Bob Chapek in the middle of the night on a Sunday and brought back 
Papa Iger. Big Papa Iger. How's that working out for you? Oh, not so well. Disney struggles as stock falls to nine-year low and park attendance slows. Wall Street asks, why not make a clean break? Well, it's too late for that because Disney's already broken. Since the weatherman Bobby Iger has come back, things have gone straight down and it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I call that justice. From Disney's most recent earnings report, page seven, lower operating income at our domestic parks and resorts was attributable to a decrease at Walt Disney World Resort. I wonder what caused that. But wait, there's more. Also on page seven, the decrease at our merchandising licensing business was due to lower revenue from merchandise based on Star Wars. Toy Story, and The Avengers. And now, thanks to his comments during the strike, Bobby Iger, the former toast of Tinseltown, is now its biggest villain. And no, Disney, don't blame the strike and that lack of promotion for all your failures. I just want to remind everyone that Barbenheimer did happen. Two massive hits that came out the same weekend that didn't have any promotion during their runs. But not to worry, following Ahsoka, we get Harvey Weinstein's former personal assistant, Leslie Headland's The Acolyte. Um, so my character, you know, she's a, she's a powerful leader. She's a powerful leader. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, in a very woman-centered world, which I, I was very excited to kind of be in that, because I feel like Star Wars is, is very, like, patriarchal, so it was kind of cool to have, like, this sort of woman-centered figure. Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> Mm. I mean, the best parts about Star Wars is there is no good or evil. It depends on what side you're standing on. What? What the f Hate to break this to you, but after 10 years, it's pretty clear that Disney can't make Star Wars, but what they're really good at is killing it. Maybe you shouldn't have lied to your audience and put Han, Luke, and Leia in a scene together. Maybe you shouldn't have canceled LucasArts and the EU. Maybe you should have fired Kathleen Kennedy when you had the chance. Maybe you shouldn't have turned a boy's brand into a girl's brand that neither like anymore. Maybe you should have listened to the fandom instead of making them your enemy. It's not a question of whether the Star Wars fandom is split anymore. It's a question of how many are left. They decided they didn't want to use those stories. They decided they were going to go do their own thing. And so I decided, fine. But basically, I'm not going to try to... They weren't that keen to have me involved anyway. But at the same time, I said, I'm not going to... If I get in there, I'm just going to cause trouble because they're not going to do what I want them to do. So, And I don't have the control to do that anymore. And all I would do is muck everything up. So I said, OK, I will go my way and I'll let them go their way. And it really does come down to uh, a simple rule of life, which is when you break up with somebody, the first rule is no phone calls. The second rule, you don't go over to their house and drive by to see what they're doing. Yes. The third one is you don't show up at their coffee shop or their things like you're gonna run it. You just say, no, gone, history, I'm moving forward. Because every time you do, and you know, we all learn this from experience, every time you do something like that, you're opening the wound again. And it just makes it harder for you. You have to put it behind you, and it's a very, very, very hard thing to do. But you have to just cut it off and say, okay, end the ball game. I gotta move on. And everything in your body says, don't, you can't. And these are my kids. So all those Star Wars films. All the Star Wars films. They were your kids. Yeah, well they are right. You know, I I loved them, I created them. Um I'm very intimately involved in them, and obviously to and sell you them sold off, them. I sold them to the white slavers. Nerdorotic.com.